For 52 years and counting, John MacArthur has pastored Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California. It's a modest, diverse community in the San Fernando Valley, which has been called America's suburb, just north of the sprawling metropolis that is Los Angeles. Oh, I'm packing my grip. That's Bing Crosby, in case you're a millennial. He was the old groaner. He saw the San Fernando Valley as an almost idenic place to raise a farm and a family. But, after World War II, the valley started changing. And by the late 1960s, the valley was becoming more commercial and urban than the image of Bing Crosby's tomb. So in other words, we have new shopping centers, uh, there are more tracks, it's getting more dense. There are, uh, Ventura Boulevard is a, is a bustling shopping area for 20 miles. That was Mark Wanamaker. He wrote a book on the history of the San Fernando Valley. The valley uh, changed from agricultural pretty much to, to two things, aviation, motion pictures. Those people in the industry Mark mentioned, they were turning the valley into one of the most densely packed residential communities in the country. And, in God's providence, just as the people of the world were coming to the San Fernando Valley, Grace Community Church needed a pastor. In the late 60s, they'd lost two of them. The founder, Don Householder, and Richard Elvey. Both were older men. Heart attacks had promoted each to glory. So, as the church set out to find a new pastor, they had one qualification. The next pastor is going to be young. I qualified. My name is Austin Duncan. I'm the director of the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching at the Master Seminary. This is the podcast from the center, and this is season one, The Expositor. The Life and Preaching of John MacArthur. At the time, John MacArthur was 29 years old. He had degrees from Los Angeles Pacific College and Talbot Seminary. He was a regular speaker at Christian camps, Hume Lake in particular. And, for a few years, he'd been the youth pastor at his father's church, Calvary Bible, in Burbank, California. In November of 1968, the elders of Grace Church invited this young preacher to candidate. A few hundred people, mostly young families, gathered in a small chapel on Roscoe Boulevard, at the very center of the San Fernando Valley and listened as John preached, and preached, and preached. I came on a Sunday night, and I basically was so filled up with Romans 6 and 7 that I just kind of opened my Bible with a few notes and just went through it, oblivious to the reality of time. I think I, I, think I talked for an hour and 15 minutes. Well, that was just completely outrageous in those days. It was a 20, 25-minute sermon church. And Patricia's famous line was, well, there goes that opportunity. You know, do you have any idea what you're doing? And I said, well, I was just trying to help him understand it. It, um, it seemed that maybe I had sort of made sure I wouldn't have any opportunity to come to that church by being so long-winded. But they came back and said, you know, that's what we want. Can you teach us the word like that? Maybe not that long, but yeah. It was small. That chapel, our small church now, that's all that there was there. There were chicken coops in the back. That was Patricia MacArthur, John's beloved wife of nearly 60 years. Did you think he was going to get the job? I didn't worry about it. I don't know. I was just married to him. Two months later, John MacArthur officially became the pastor of Grace Community Church on February 9th, 1969. His first Sunday was a cold, rainy day. One of those rare days where there's actually weather in what Southern Californians refer to as winter. 
At the time, Patricia and John had little kids. Their oldest was five, and then they had a three-year-old and a one-year-old on that rainy day. Now the rain was pounding down, and it was actually flooding Roscoe Boulevard, which, as you know, is a pretty rare situation in Southern California. John titled his first sermon, How to Play Church. Listen to how he begins. This morning, I want to present to you a discussion on the particular verses, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, and talk about, well, as the subject was advertised, how to play church, church, or the false church incorporated within the true church. Because I think that we have to examine ourselves to begin with to see where we really are before we know what we need. And so this Sunday and next Sunday, I'll be presenting messages dealing with the church and the ministry. You have your Bibles. Note, please, Matthew 7, beginning at verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name or preached in thy name? And in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Here we have a young pastor on day one of his new pulpit ministry, reading that text and preaching a sermon about false believers in the church. He's not exactly easing in to his new gig. Right out of the launch pad. Yeah, that that is still the defining characteristic, I think, of my preaching as a body of work through half a century is to address the issue of true and false salvation, true and false believers. And from that launch pad, an unprecedented ministry began. 52 years later, the breadth of it all is staggering, seemingly impossible to calculate. But let's give it a try, starting with the sermons themselves. How many sermons are available on Grace to You's website? More than 3,500. I don't know the exact number, but it's around 3,500 and change. That's Phil Johnson, Executive Director of Grace to You, the media ministry of John MacArthur. And do you do you have data on the top of your head, approximate of, of kind of how many of how many of these sermons have been put across the world, downloaded? I mean, things changed when they just opened up the vaults. Talk right. about that a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, we we get about two million downloads every month uh, just from our website. Did you hear that? Two million every month. In November of 2008, Grace to You first made all of John's sermons available free of charge at their website. They are now closing in on 250 million downloads. That's a quarter of a billion of John MacArthur sermons. It seems to me that more people actually use the YouTube versions than the ones who download the MP3s from our website. So I would guess at minimum is six to seven million sermons every month that get downloaded and listened to. That's obviously a staggering number, but it doesn't include all the CDs, the millions of tapes Grace to You has distributed over the years, or the millions and millions of people who've heard John on the radio. And then you add the commentaries, 33 volumes covering the entire New Testament. And don't forget about the MacArthur Study Bible, which has been translated into eight languages and counting. And then there's the Master Seminary. John started that school on the campus of Grace Church in 1986. Over the past 35 years, it's sent thousands of fully equipped pastors and preachers around the United States and the world. There's also the Master's University, where John is the chancellor. He served as president for 35 years. And most importantly, Grace Community Church. From a one-building church with a few hundred people, it's become one of the largest churches in America. Close to 7,000 people attend each week. Hundreds of missionaries have gone from Grace Church to the world to repeat the model they learned under John's ministry. Bottom line, John MacArthur is one of the most influential, important, historical Christians of the past half century. You can't tell this period of church history without talking about JMAC. And this podcast is going to ask a very simple question. 
why? What is it that makes MacArthur, well, MacArthur? Why is his preaching, the focus of his ministry, so influential? How is his approach to the text unique? We're going to answer those questions over the next eight episodes. To understand John, you have to figure out what makes him tick, what gets him up in the morning, what he cares about. Simply put, you have to understand what motivates his preaching ministry. Let's start that answer with what is not a motivation, changing the culture. John MacArthur has no interest in that. If he did, John would have had preached a lot more from the headlines. And there were plenty of headlines in 1969 to choose from. To get an understanding of the culture of 1969, the year MacArthur started his ministry at Grace Church, I called one of America's finest historians, Francis Fitzgerald. The 1960s and 70s was a very tumultuous period in American life, you know, marked by demonstrations, assassinations, the resignation of a president. Her 2017 book, The Evangelicals, The Struggle to Shape America, was a finalist for the National Book Award and is, in many ways, the definitive account of evangelicals from the Puritans to today. And it was also a time of social and cultural upheavals that made many conservative Protestants think of as shaking the foundations of American society. The period began with the election of a Catholic president, the first in the nation's history, and was followed by two Supreme Court decisions that banned prayer and Bible reading in the public schools. In 64 and 65, Congress passed the President Johnson's two civil rights acts, which for the first time gave African Americans the rights of full citizenship. And then came the war and the anti-war demonstrations and um, the change in cultural attitudes in everything from sex and gender roles to child rearing practices, race, civil liberties, religion, and the natural environment. American exceptionalism was falling apart. 1969 came towards the end of that period, of course, um, but the cultural revolution, as it were, was still very much in sway. And when it comes to the evangelical culture of that day, Ms. Fitzgerald honed in on one particular man, one especially recognizable voice that dominated the landscape. Billy Graham, who had, um, since the 50s, managed to uh, unite virtually all conservative Protestants in his crusades. In the midst of the pessimism and the gloom, and the frustration of this present hour, there's only one hope. And that hope was expressed by Jesus Christ when he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That clip is from the summer of 1969, just a few months after MacArthur began his ministry at Grace. He called himself an evangelical, which was a term that had gone out of use because in the 19th century, virtually all American Protestants were evangelicals. So he redefined it to uh, mean conservative Protestant. Graham is preaching to a packed stadium in Anaheim, California. He's focused on the cultural moment. Contemporary references, stories from the world, they're all over his sermons. And he appealed to many denominations and made important friends, particularly with all the presidents in that period in the interests of converting Americans to evangelicalism. Meanwhile, 45 miles to the north, John MacArthur takes a completely different approach. As I read those early sermons, you you didn't address those kind of things. You instead are so immersed in the biblical world, and that's where you're trying to bring people. You would borrow from those things uh, just to you know, I mean, the, the only way you can really date those sermons is, is sometimes you'll make a reference maybe in an initial introduction or a, a passing illustration to something happening in the world today. But you're not engaging those topics. Instead, you're you're trapped in the gospel of Matthew forever, you know, or something like that. Right. And, and there was um, there was no question in my mind that that's where I had to start. It wouldn't do me any good to, to talk about issues and give people 
some kind of personal insight into issues or even biblical insight into issues unless they had a foundation and a framework. That right there is what did motivate John MacArthur. When he came to Grace Church in 1969, he didn't want to change the culture. He didn't want to follow in Billy Graham's footsteps flying around the world to speak to pack stadiums. He didn't want to be political or culturally sensitive or addicted to the headlines. He had one thought, one driving motivation. Teach the Word of God and teach it in depth and teach it with clarity. And so people think biblically, and then they can be discerning. On day one of his 52-year and counting ministry, John MacArthur decided he was going to preach the text and preach it accurately. A simple goal. And how to accomplish that goal? Well, that was also clear to MacArthur when he came to Grace Church. He knew he needed to study, and study, and then study some more. So he told the church leadership that he would devote the bulk of his time during the week to sermon preparation. Undoubtedly, the leadership thought that was odd. They wondered why someone would need so much time to prepare his sermons. I used to say for every hour I preached, there would be eight to ten hours of preparation. I can't unpack the eight to ten hours, but by the time I get to that pulpit, all of those eight to ten hours have yielded this clarity. And for me, that that is the, as I said, that's the that discovery process is the joy of ministry. That's my happy place is in my study. Uh, coming out and, and preaching is a duty that I discharge, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. But it's almost like it's almost like an addendum to the discovery because it doesn't it doesn't have the same emotional satisfaction preaching doesn't that the discovery did. If I never preached anything, just the incredible exercise of I get this. Wow, this is the revelation of God, and I get it. I understand it. I, I know what he's saying. That discovery is so exhilarating to me that sometimes I can barely contain myself. You can hear John MacArthur's motivation, unchanged since the winter of 1969. He loves the Word of God. Every day, he's motivated to study it, to dig into the context, the background, the original languages, the characters, the theology. He loves every jot and tittle of the Bible. And understanding it, that's what motivates him. And that's what must motivate every true expositor. Because that's what an expositor does. He gets the text right, and he shares its meaning with his people. In 1961, an old preacher named Doug Floyd Schaefer wrote an article in Christianity Today that powerfully describes the kind of work that MacArthur just talked about. Since Mr. Schaefer is no longer with us, I got a friend of mine to sub in. Paul Twiss, a professor of Bible exposition at the Master Seminary, is going to read a portion of his article because nobody reads like Paul Twiss. Fling him into his office. Tear the office sign from the door and nail on the sign, study. Take him off the mailing list. Lock him up with his books. Get him all kinds of books. And his typewriter and his Bible. Slam him down on his knees before texts, broken hearts, and the flippant lives of a superficial flock and the holy God. Throw him into the ring to box with God till he learns how short his arms are. Engage him to wrestle with God all the night through. Let him come out only when he is bruised and beaten into being a blessing. Set a time clock on him that will imprison him with thought and writing about God for 40 hours a week. Shut his garrulous mouth forever spouting remarks and stop his tongue always tripping lightly over everything non-essential. Require him to have something to say before he dare break silence. Bend his knees in the lonesome valley, fire him from the PTA and cancel his country club membership. Burn his eyes with weary study, wreck his emotional poise with worry for God and make him exchange his pious stance for a humble walk with God and man. Make him spend and be spent 
for the glory of God. The other benefit we haven't talked about with this is being in the public eye all the time, being up front, being the guy can generate a lot of pride. I mean, even um, the best of us, you know, are, are going to be tempted to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. But the word in the process of discovery just keeps knocking you down. It just keeps breaking you back down again. So by the time you get to Sunday, virtually every Sunday, you're kind of a broken person. So the, the word it has a crushing impact on us because no matter how we have matured in the Lord, we fall short all the time. So we're always, we're always living in the reality that I'm preaching a better message than I'm able to live. Brokenness is a critical part of being effective, and uh, that's why that passage in 2 Corinthians 12 is so important where Paul prays three times that the Lord would remove a thorn in his flesh. And the Lord says, no, because strength is perfected in weakness. And what breaks you and crushes you, as Peter says, after you've suffered a while, the Lord make you perfect. So I think you could say, well, isn't that suffering like people don't like you or you get an illness or something? Well, that, that may have a role to play. But the, the most profound suffering is the constant exposure of your own heart to what you are before God. And as an expositor, that's going on all the time, all the time, all the time. It's relentless. Uh, so that a faithful expositor should be manifestly a man of authority, but a man of humility. Because you're just constantly being broken by what, what it is that you're having to preach. If you're listening to this and you're a pastor or you aspire to be a pastor, I have a question for you. Why is it that you want to preach? Why do you want to be a pastor? Is it because you love the Bible? Is it because you're gripped by the word of God and you want, you need, you have to understand it? Are you eager for the brokenness that John just described? Are you willing to study until you know the meaning of the text and then live as if you believe that meaning? The bottom line is this, do you want to know God? Do you want to be holy as he is holy? If you can say yes, a thousand times yes to both questions, then you have the motivation of an expositor. And as we'll see next time, there is a profound world altering effect when someone is driven by such a simple goal. That's episode two of The Expositor. The MacArthur Center podcast is produced by the lanky yet wise Corey Williams and by soccer phenom Jeremy Vuolo. He brings the lattes. Our editor extraordinaire is Cody from Harvard U. Special thanks to Francis Fitzgerald and Mark F. Wanamaker for lending their expertise to this episode. For more information about the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching, go to MacArthurCenter.org. And to learn more about the Master's Seminary, go to TMS. Edu. This podcast would not be possible apart from the generous donors who make training men a reality as we seek to build expositors for God's glory here at the Master Seminary. Thanks for listening. ATD, out.